report or And I am going to give everyone the ability to share their screen. I will start with sharing mine. Start. Okay, I am attorney Demetrius Evans, and this is Unlocking Opportunities, Navigating African Trade, Customs Clearance, History, Dynamics of Oil, Gas, Agribusiness, and more. We're going to talk about a lot, a lot of things today. Here are my guests, Chuck Lay, uh, Comey Clue, and uh-oh, Jamila, I can't even see your name down there, but it's Lewis Johnson. So this is me. I am the managing attorney of the Evans International Law Firms and also the chair for Global Chamber Chicago. This is an event that is put on by Global Chamber Chicago. And so I want to say thank you to all of our members um, at the Global, Global Chamber period, but definitely those in Chicago um, who have worked with us. And this is the agenda that I am proposing. It, we may go off kilter a little bit because I've learned so much just in, in researching these topics. So I will start off with an introduction of why Africa, why now? Um, I'll go a little bit, and these are gonna be fast. It looks like it's gonna take a, a while, but the history of African trade, I'll, I'm gonna talk about three different trade agreements or things that are going on. And then we're gonna move to my guests with where to trade, how to trade, what to trade, and then we'll go into some questions. So first up, I have um, Charles Lay, uh, affectionately known as Chuck. He is a technological consultant, professional based, um, that should be in, in Chicago with 15 years of managing multinational workforces and technology integration. He operates a Cisco Academy and is currently a Microsoft Cloud partner. Jamile, am I pronouncing that right? Jamil. Jamil, okay. Beautiful picture. I love it. Lewis Johnson, who is a licensed custom broker in the New York metro area, formerly a transportation security officer at TSA, and now works for Just Your Broker, where she navigates cost effective custom clearances. And last but not least, we have Comey Clue, who is an investment advisor, an author, and a speaker on African focused trade a risk coach and business management consulting investing insurance professional. Okay, so why trade with Africa? Why now? And my big takeaway is Africa is right now a 1.2 billion person market that is on the cusp of transforma transformative growth. It's getting ready to explode if it hasn't already. Okay, so convince me. Here's your convincing. Africa is set to outperform the world with its GDP, which is projected to grow 4.5 annually, offering immense market potential. U.S.-Africa trade in 2023 reached $142 billion, highlighting the growing partnership. Diverse economies in Africa offer opportunities in various sectors, and Africa is home to 30% of the world's mineral reserves, 8% of the world's natural gases, and 12% of the world's oil reserves. 40% of the world's gold and up to 90% of its chromium and platinum. The largest reserves of cobalt, diamonds, platinum, and uranium in the world. It holds 65% of the world's arable land and 10% of the planet's um, renewable fresh water source. I hope I convinced you with that, but don't just stop there. We have some key sectors in the natural resources in Africa, agriculture, energy markets, minerals, health infrastructure, pharmaceutical industries, light manufacturing, transportation, logistics, the digital economy is booming and there's more. So it's just a smart place for, for investors to be globally trading. Now, Africa, here's, we're gonna just segue into the history. So when I look at Africa on the map, it seems like it's proportionate to all the other continents, but it's actually not true. It's way bigger than I thought. It dwarfs China, 
Europe, and the United States and India. Africa is the origin of our species. Species. Back 7 million years ago, the black-skinned people, and that's necessary to say because it's hot and sunny, and so you had to be black-skinned just to absorb all of the heat. It was first named, I don't know how to say this, Alkibulan, and that was the Garden of Eden because that's where the first bones of Lucy are found. It's the home of the first use of fire, cutting tools, astronomy, jewelry, fishing, mathematics, crops, art, use of pigments, cutting, and animal domestication. So I wanted to figure out, so what, what is this glorious past and trade? So I found that during the third through the sixth century, there was a kingdom known as Aska. At the crossroads of Africa, Arabia, and the Greco-Roman world was the most powerful state between the Eastern Roman Empire and Persia. And in command of, they had command of ivory, gold, emeralds, silk, spices, agriculture, um, salt, exotic animals, manufactured goods, and they imported copper, bronze, silver, um, and, and gold and wine. Well, I think I don't I think I got that mixed up. I don't think they imported gold. I think they were exporting gold, but they imported the wine and they increased their wealth from tariffs on other countries. Sudan, its fleet controlled the Red Sea trade through the port of Adulis and the inland routes of northeastern Africa. We move on to the fourth century and we go to Kush. Wait a minute. Well, this is in the middle. Kush is another another huge empire that was uh, important in the trade routes in Africa. So the fourth century, formerly known as Nubia, and Nub, I learned this, means gold, was a highly advanced um, society with wealth, power, and cultural development, and it was known for its gold mines. Kush, Kush's location and its natural resources made it an important trading hub or a center linking Central and Southern Africa to Egypt. And there, uh, I just have a little map where you can see where Kush is in relation to the Red Sea or where Kush was. I guess Kush still is, but not called Kush anymore. The last of uh, the great empires that I found is from the 14th century, and it was the Kingdom of Mali. Now, there is a very famous king. Um, his name was Mansa Musa, who built Timbuktu. And Timbuktu is in on the left. Timbuktu uh, is a was a great um, center of learning that rarely do we hear it taught, at least in, in, in the United States. It was never taught to me in, in any kind of history class. But gold dust was traded not only as a currency with salt and cotton, but was also a trade. People bought gold dust. Um, and for that, I wore my Kari shells. So I hope you can see that. The curry shells came from the Indian Ocean, where they were later used as currency in internal trade of Western Sahara Africa. I found this fascinating. Um, heter heterarchy is a form of management that is different from hi hierarchies, right? What, what we normally see in the world today. And this was a form of govern governing where others depended on each other and circumstances and no one unit dominated the rest. So what happened? What happened? Well, we all know what happened. The slave trade happened because you have all this gold going. You have these people that are in control of salt, minerals, ivory. By the way, all the all the all the ivory was um, going down because they were killing all of the um, all of the elephants for their tusk. But in the 16th century, the Portuguese decided to buy slaves from West African slavers. Yes, Africans, some Africans were using slaves, but the slaves were more like indentured servant, servants um, and they it was just contractual. But in the 16th century, we see the Portuguese with their first slave voyage to Brazil and other European countries. Um, and then it just started to spiral. Now Africans, instead of trade 
freighting or now being the, the cargo to be transported to the American Americas as quickly and cheaply as possible. They were sold to work on uh, coffee, tobacco, cocoa, sugar, and cotton plantations, as well as gold and silver mines, uh, rice fields. They were um, very instrumental in cutting timber for ships, skilled labor, and domestic servants. Um, because they no longer had this indentured servitude, which is a contractual base for workers um, that was very important in Britain and Ireland, it, it continued. And then the wealth of other nations just just continued to you know, skyrocket while Africa was being um, the, the not only were now the people being taken, but or sold, and now you also had the the um, the minerals and everything being taken. And one of the worst things about this time in history in the 17th century is that children born to slaves then also became slaves. So that had never happened before. And one thing that I learned in the United States is that then they started to when when slavery was actually outlawed, they started to have slave plantations where they were just breeding the slaves. So some men were only there for purposes of breeding slaves. And if you look at that dynamic, think about that dynamic, a lot of what's happened to black people um, around the diaspora, you can kind of see why this happened. So instead of selling the goods and services, um, Africans became the goods and services. Now, what did this do? It was a, a drain on 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 the on the people of Africa, right? So right now you have um, the medium age of around twenty, and these these young people have now decided they are going to be innovators and adapters of all things digital, because just as you know, history would have it, then you had this digital millennium, and now everybody has a, a smartphone. 122 million active users of, of mobile financial services in Africa. The smartphone connections doubled from 315 million in 2015 to 636 million in 22, price um, twice the projected number in North America and not far from the total in Europe. Mobile data traffic um, across Africa increased sevenfold. And I just want to show you a couple of videos if I can pop them up. Okay, I'm going to stop that and I, I'll share my slides. But what I want you to know is now you have these young people that have decided, hey, we're going to start making phones and we are going to compete with China. Guess what else the young people are doing? So as you see, there is much innovation coming out of Africa, and but what would you expect? Uh oh. I didn't mean to start these over. Okay, so embracing innovation, technology-driven solutions for African logistics. Mobile technology is revolutionizing the supply chain management, payments across Africa, of course, blockchain technology, enhancing transparency and security and trade transactions. E-commerce platforms are expanding the market reach for businesses of all sides. And this made me think of Wakanda, the Black Panther.
Very interesting how we're coming full circle. Moving into what I think is really going to make us full circle with the African landscape and trade is the African Growth and Opportunity Act. It's a GOA. It provides duty-free access for thousands of African products into the U.S. market. But you have to know as we expand or as Africans expand into the U.S. market, it opens up the world. There is also the uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation. This is a corporation, a bilateral agreement between the United States Foreign Aid Agency um, established by Congress in 2004, an independent agency that is offering grants to invest in infrastructure and governance, creating a more con uh, conducive trade environment. There are double taxation agreements to reduce tax burdens and encourage investments between U.S. and African countries. And there's also AFCA. This is the largest free trade agreement that we have ever seen. It brings together 55 different countries to create a single market for goods and services to enhance the movement of capital and natural persons on the African continent. A continent. So with without any any kind of reservations, the AFCA agreement is going to take us back, I think, to where we were or what Africa would have been had it not been dis disrupted by the slave trade and the scramble for, for Africa so that now the growth can continue um, to happen. Is the end of my presentation until I've heard from all of my colleagues. Let's um, let's now go over to Comey. You are able to share if you'd like. Yeah, thank you very much, Demetrius. Thank you very much for that powerful introduction. Um, uh, I will say that you have taken us to a history class our very own history. And I would like to add something, uh, if I may. A, a slave trade was initiated and started by the Arabs. They came to Africa, to the coast of Africa. We welcomed them uh, as our neighbors because across the Arabian Sea, we welcomed them as our neighbors and they took advantage of our grandfather. The reason why we don't see much black people in the Arab countries is because they castrated all our grandfathers that were slaves out there. And then later on the European um, uh, piggybacked on that. That being said, we, we're not here to dwell on the past, but rather we are here to learn from the past to build our bright future. That's why I titled my presentation, Africa, A New Horizon. Brothers and sisters, Africa has a bright future. I will not tell you if that were, if it were not so. Uh, I'm currently in the US, but most of the time, 95% uh, of my time I spend it in Africa, where I left my corporate job. You can look me up. Uh, on LinkedIn, I left my corporate job and I moved to Africa completely. That's where I work from. And this would not be possible if it were not for a technology and technological advance. And I'm glad that you talked about the way our young uh, folks embrace technology and they are working miracles. Um, we just got off the phone, a, 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 a wonderful call and I think I think Ruby Golo is on the on, on the line, and I thank her for putting this call together. Uh, the call was how to leverage social media and 
uh, artificial intelligence to boost your business penetration. And the call was organized by the Global Chamber Accra chapter, of which I'm the uh, advisory board chair. And we have attendance from everywhere in the globe when a lot of people attended. It was a young brother based in Ghana who just took us all through the power of technology and how we can boost it. Now, how we can boost our businesses. Who would have thought even five years ago that an, Af an African will be uh, leading uh, a consultant on all things technology? This takes me to another topic and then I'll jump into my presentation. Uh, today, the biggest financial system in the world is of African origin. FinTech, financial a, a technology was created in Africa by our brothers in Kenya. And there's something called M-Pesa. Um, we can talk about that later. So I want to set the, the record straight just to make sure that those of us who are still Afro-pessimistic, we need to renew our mind. Uh, Africa is here, and there are good things that are happening in Africa. Um, so let's jump into the presentation. We want to talk about trade opportunities in, in Africa. And I will have been asked to focus mostly on oil and gas and, and agro the agro sector. Oil and gas. Um, what is happening there? In the areas of oil and gas, we see that um, the population is growing so fast that the demand in oil and gas sector is outpacing uh, is outpacing our ability, our production capability. But I will not talk about oil and gas without touching on something new that is happening on the continent. Um, for the first time, Africa this year, Africa has been able to get on a map as far as value addition in the oil and gas sector is concerned. The biggest African uh, refinery now uh, that is has been online uh, this year created by Dangote, Aliko Dangote, is based in Lagos, Nigeria. And and it was built only with the idea of refining the African oil. But quickly, he realized that he would not be competitive if he did not refine any other oil. Guess what? He turned to the US and started importing US crude that he's refining in Africa. And he's planning to sell that. We can use it in Africa, or we can export it to Europe, to whoever needs it. Who would have ever thought that we Africans will be importing crude oil from the United States of America, refining it on our continent and exporting it? That is how Africa is changing. That is how Africa is changing. As far as oil and gas landscape is concerned, I said it already. The population is growing and the economy is growing really fast. Speaking of uh, 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 economic growth, uh, Africa is the fastest growing region in the world. Everybody knows that. I mean, a country like, like how do you call it? Niger, they said their economic growth will be like double digit this year. And, but the, you know, the mainstream media will not talk about that, of course, but, most of the African, uh, 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 sub-Saharan African countries, they are growing and they continue to grow fast despite the economic challenges that they are, they are facing. With this growth, we have a new a need for more uh, production, oil and gas production. There's needs also to invest in renewable energy. And the oil and gas companies are being smart they are starting to invest in renewable energy also. And those people who want to invest, like I said it already, there is uh, Dangote 
a refinery, which is a very good example, you can invest in Africa. And the point I want to make here, as far as the landscape is concerned, is within Africa, because of the, after the free trade agreement within African continent, when you come to Africa and you set up shops in one African country, like my country in Ghana, you have access to the entire continent. That, that's, that, that's the legal framework that this agreement offers you. So you can produce whatever uh, 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 you want to produce in Ghana and ship it to any other African country. country. And believe me, you have access to 1.4 or 1.6 now billion uh, uh, people on the continent and growing, growing fast. Now, what are the opportunities? Yes, I don't want to bore you with too much information, but the opportunities are in exploration and production. As far as oil is concerned, we still have a lot of untapped resources in Africa. So exploration and production. Because the second type of opportunity is to service the needs, the energy, energy needs of the, the growing urban population. As Africa is developing, the, 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 our urban centers are growing really fast. With that growth, there is more demand in uh, LNG to power their homes and to for cooking and so forth. I mean, you guys know we can no longer do, you know, uh, firewood in, 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 in urban area. So that demand is growing really fast. And we have some very interesting projects in Egypt, Nigeria, and Mozambique. And Ghana has finished, almost finished building its LNG pipeline, uh, which will be connected to our thermal refinery. Um, uh, uh, so that's a, a parenthesis. There is a movement also toward gas to power. So because Africa has a lot of natural gas, so there's a movement toward gas to power, which uh, the energy companies, uh, some of them are my clients on the continent, they are using gas, natural gas, to generate electricity. Now, this morning, uh, I received a message on the news. There is more talk about, more discussion around uh, nuclear energy. Because remember, Africa has a lot of uranium. We don't need nuclear power or we don't need nuclear uh, 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 ammunition uh, 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 to do anything. Just for economic uh, and civil use, I think African governments have started discussions with people to start building nuclear uh, 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 electricity uh, generation. So this is what is happening on the, um, on the oil and gas uh, front. To summarize, if anybody wants to invest in the oil and gas front, you need to focus on the on the domestic consumption. When I say domestic, I mean the continental, African continental uh, domestic consumption. Here is a study of Mackenzie. Mackenzie has projected that demand for oil globally will grow by 10% by 2010, by 2014. Guess what? The growth rate is in Africa by 2040, almost 30%. Because we are just rebuilding our economy. My sister, uh, Demetrius, has shown us that our economy was built before and then it was destroyed. Now we are rebuilding our economy. So that's why the demand is so high. So anybody who wants to invest in oil and gas, who has expertise, who wants to import or export any know-how, any downstream product or service or know-how, you can contact us and we can connect you with, with uh, the right uh, parties and the decision makers uh, because our firm is represented, has footprint in 35 countries in Africa. So we can connect you to the right people, wherever it is. Now, let's come back, go back to uh, the topic which is near and dear to my heart. I, I almost told Dimitri that I did not even want to talk about oil and gas because uh, I've done it for so many years. Now I'm focused 
on agriculture, feeding our people. That's where my focus is. But since I do have some knowledge in energy, that's why I talked about it. In agribusiness, the opportunities are big, are huge. Um, Demetrius talked about um, the AGOA, which is African Growth and Opportunity Act. Currently, we have some, uh, 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 there is a grain called fonio. It is a wild grain. It's like, like rice. If anybody want, you can just uh, tap me on LinkedIn and I can send you some sample. It is so healthy. It's called fonio. Now, Amazon, that that purchase, I think fresh food, right? Whatever you call it. Amazon, Amazon bought some kind of foods company, I forgot the name. They specialize in that and they are selling it. And that grain is grown only in Africa. It is so healthy. It's called fonio. If you want, I can share, send some sample to you. You try, gluten free. So that is the future of Africa. Now that people are health conscious, and people want to eat organic and natural, the um, business opportunities in Africa are huge. First of all, we have 60% of uncultivated land that we can use to grow whatever we want to grow, that, that we can use to become the bread basket of the world. That's why I'm so excited about agriculture and, and agro opportunity in Africa. Um, this is also, also think about uh, the internal uh, uh, demand because our population is growing and we import almost everything. Uh, almost everything as far as food is concerned. Now we the, the, the thought leaders have realized that it is important that we feed ourselves. So the opportunities are huge. But while we're feeding ourselves, the uh, overflow, the overproduction can be, can be used for exports toward the U.S. I have a couple of clients who are in the food business in the U.S. And almost every week, they import food, food from, from, the, uh, from West Africa, mostly. That's why I'm really interested to talk to the sister who, who does, uh, how do you call it? Customs clearing. I, I want to talk to you after, 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 after the call. So we are always importing foods, food item, um, from Africa. It is very important. People don't see that, but it, it is, it is happening. Now, um, I have, I can, I will share, uh, uh, we will send you a copy of the, uh, the presentation. Uh, in areas of food and agriculture, investment opportunities are huge. In food processing, distribution, and prepare foods to be distributed within the urban area. I mean, Kentucky Fried Chicken is making so much money in Ghana. You go to Ghana, you are in line. But we Ghanaian, we like our own food. So you can buy your chicken and buy your jollof rice and buy our hot pepper and add to it. It's called it's called shito. That's how they have they have they have localized the food, but they're making so much money and they are increasing the price every day. But people are still buying. So anybody who wants to invest in that area can invest in food production, food distribution, logistics, and the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. We talked about it already. The Secretariat is based in Ghana. So we can, Ruby and I, we can uh, be happy to facilitate anybody who wants to do business in the food and agriculture area. Okay, there is, this is like the, the, the final bonus and then I will stop talking. Did you know that the African chili pepper has a market value now globally of 5 billion? Five billion, and the growth is like it's expected to grow by uh, uh, up to six point six billion by twenty thirty two. These are things that people don't tell you. The chili pepper, we produce it. People don't value it in Africa, 
But a few countries that have started exporting it, they are making money. And the, the biggest destination for it is China. I don't know why. Maybe they like spicy food. I don't know. But they're buying a lot of African uh, chili pepper. I just wanted to share that with you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. And I will take any question. No, I'll stop. And somebody else will present before we take question. Thank you. Amazing. Um, I Jacob, did you did have a question. Jacob, would you like to ask your question before we go on to um, Chuck? Yeah, yeah, Comey, and I hate to send you back to oil and gas. Uh, I feel like we're similar in that we left those days behind. But I was just curious about um, up and coming like African owned producers, uh, like, you know, to are there on the continent drillers and producers that are African owned companies, uh, African led, um, or is it still outside operators, total, big giants coming in and, and operating those fields? That's it. That, that's a good question. No, currently we do not have hundred percent African owned uh, uh, producers because uh, of the it, it, it is capital incentive. As you know, access to capital is a big problem uh, in Africa. But what we have seen though in Ghana, Angola, uh, and other oil producing countries, we have seen some PPP arrangement. So uh, the, the 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 foreign entity will come. And then they do a private, uh, a public-private uh, partnership with something that we call local content. We have our, our lawyer, a practicing lawyer. I'm no longer. I mean, I mean, we have some some lawyers on the line, so they can they can explain the uh, local content law. But that's what we have. But because it is so so energy uh, uh, um, so capital intensive. However. Um, if you are interested or you, I mean, you are from the oil and gas sector, you are interested, um, ping me because we have a an oil and gas meeting in Accra the 27th of next month. One of the big producers is putting something and my firm is providing business intelligence to them. So uh, on March 27th, whatever information you need, um, I will get it for you. Thank you. Amazing. No, thanks, Thank thanks you for that me. question. No Thank problem. You. No problem. Uh, okay. I, wa I was going to go to Chuck, but Chuck, just because ladies first, I think that I will go to Ms. Lewis Johnson. Let us hear from her on um, customs. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. So um, I wanted to put like some real life situations with shipments that I handle from Africa. Um, one of the biggest problems is not knowing the rules and regulations before it's being shipped, like the ISF not being filed and the shipments already on the water. There's actually a five thousand dollar penalty for that if you don't file it with at least twenty four hours before it being placed on the vessel. Uh, another thing that I see is when um, people are bring, showing their invoices, um, it's not clear what the product is. I know a lot of times they're using like the names that are being known um, mainly to people in Africa that, um, you know, anyone in America may not be familiar with. So I put some examples of some products that people had. Um, it was Gary, I don't know how to pronounce this, I don't want to mess up the names. But um, I put a list of the names there, basically like cassava meal and ground melon. So my suggestion is if you have an invoice and it's not clear what it is to someone that's not familiar with the product, you can put it in parentheses and write exactly what it is just so people are clear. Um, the goal is when customs look at your invoice that they know exactly what it is. They can kind of classify the product without reaching back to you on what it is. So you want to just make it easy for them. Another issue that I had with um, this client in particular was um, he imported chicken flavored noodles. Um, he didn't have a veterinary health certificate, um, basically showing the inspection from the country of origin, which was Nigeria. Um, so it was rejected also because it didn't have the country name on it. So just looking into those things, having that in place, um, these can help uh, avoid delays. If I have all that information in advance, I could upload the documents as soon as I have it. Because he didn't have it, we had to wait a couple of days and that caused a lot of storage fees. And then we had to wait for documentation, this time zone difference with Nigeria to get the paperwork corrected. 
it closed just a, and then our trucker pulled out actually too then i had to scramble to find another trucker to pick it up last minute it was just a lot of problems with this one shipment the next one that i have I had another shipment also coming from Nigeria. It was undervalued. So what happened is I entered everything as it was listed on the commercial invoice and it was about $300. But then when I transmitted to customs, customs wrote me a message back saying the shipment's undervalued. So I'm like, I looked at the invoice. I was like, this is the correct value that was listed on the invoice. So this should be the value that I have to enter. Um, I don't know what happened with that, but what happened was the importer told me that they actually just had the price of what it was made, how how much it costs to get it made, not like all the other details for it. Like I guess like the work, the labor, not the transaction value that was needed. So it was about a $2,200 difference. So I had to get the importer to write a letter to customs and also get revised documentation to correct the shipment. There was of course more storage um, delays and stuff like that. And a lot of these things can be avoided if you speak to someone before you ship you can get a quotation. I can educate you on what you need on your paperwork. If there's any labeling requirements for your product, I can talk to you more about that in depth, especially with food products. Um, just having your goods classified in advance, especially if you're shipping large amounts of food, um, we can get a lot of the problems solved earlier if you actually speak to someone like myself in advance and I can help you through everything. Um, those are just some of the issues that I've seen. I've also seen another one that I forgot to add was um, somebody shipped a product that was regulated um, by, what was it? I forgot the government agency, but you needed a permit for it. So making sure that if you ship something, it needs a permit. Again, this has to be done in advance. So you have your permit and all the required documentation before you ship, because sometimes if you don't have it, it makes no sense to import it. You're just wasting money and time and it's not worth it. So it's just something to think about. If you guys want to reach out to me, I'll, I'll show you my contact details here. You can reach out to me. These are just some of the services that I provide. You guys have any questions? Anything? Nothing? Good. <laughs> Thank you. That means it, it, well done. Very clear. Um, looking out for those things that are then going to take a long time if you don't know them up front. So please get in touch with her if you are shipping things um, from Africa to Africa. Thank you. Um, Chuck? Are you ready? Oh, yes, I'm ready. Okay. okay. Well, I'll share my screen. And, um, okay, share. So you guys should see, I'm going to continue on uh, the theme that um, uh, Dimitri started, and, but I'm going to be a little more granular and uh, share specific countries on a macro level. More importantly, well, before I even go into this, I want to echo some of the great comments I've heard uh, from the beginning. And and I think it's really, uh, Demetrius, you're one of the few people who really echo, I want to echo when slavery started. It was actually, you're right, when we had what makes American slavery so unique is that we legalized indentured servitude. And when the Supreme Court made that ruling, that's all. That's when I always say that's when slavery began here in the US. But anyway, uh, just great facts and, and, and thanks for that. And so let me continue on. So what I wanna do, my, my topic is doing business in Africa, unlocking opportunities. So I wanna talk more on a, a, a macro level on the resources that are available here in the States, both public and private, that I think that we should take advantage of, particularly those of us who are in the global chamber. You know, that's one of the things I wanna make sure that, you know, we're doing this, our global chamber. Of course, everybody, uh, in, you don't have to be in Chicago. I just hope we continue the network. Uh, I, you know, I've had some great, opportunities when I went overseas. I went to Botswana, South Africa uh, last year and and networked with our global chamber uh, in uh, GABS as well as in South Africa. So want to continue that theme. Uh, I really enjoy the networking. It's helped me out tremendously. Now, what you guys are seeing on, on the screen now 
is um, some of the resources I use from the USA. So they had an Access Africa webinar throughout the year 2023. Uh, it talks about specifically each individual country as provided by our government. So the U.S. Commercial Service, our embassies, are advocating on our behalf. So you want to, I think you want to plug into that. And that's another resource for you to uh, participate in various events, business matching, trade summits, or just meeting and networking for the first time. Because this is all new to me. And I had an opportunity to meet and learn about individual countries. But I think it's a great series. It's called uh, Access Africa. And uh, it, it's a set of webinars and uh, really would recommend it costs about, I think it was like a hundred bucks for the year, but they're free webinars. You meet someone from the consulate. You're going to meet people, your trade reps for that particular country. And uh, they, you keep uh, right now, I would love to share with you that information, but it's not allowed to share those screens, but I'll give you a su summary of it here. But I think it's a great resource for us that we should take advantage of. Now, that's at the federal level. I'll also talk about private resources that are available to us. I'm a member of the Corporate Council of Africa. We had our annual trade mission. Uh, it was in Botswana last year. This year, we alternate. It's in, um, it'll be here in the States, in Dallas, Texas. And so our... African brothers and sisters will be coming over here. So it's just phenomenal networking. Uh, again, um, be happy to share all of that with you guys uh, um, after this is over. But want you to, th these are resources, both public and private. And of course, you all know about the Global Chamber. So um, again, in my second slide here, you could see we received market briefings on eight of the largest African economies throughout the year. So from Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Mozambique, Tanzania, Angola, Ethiopia. And again, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about South Africa and uh, Ethiopia. But again, I just think it's a valuable service that... Um, it, it helps you in this research. I know for me, I'm I'm a tech guy. I'm looking to see what are the technology opportunities. And like was pointed out, the, the mobile market, tele, telecommunications, how do we tap into that? Matching your strengths here, with, uh, what we want to export to what they want to import and vice versa. I think that's uh, a lot of the resources here at the government level you know, I just found out how to develop export plan, how to do this market research. And pretty much a lot of it is free. And, and so, again, I think that is something maybe we at the Global Chamber can spend some time. The members have separate meetings on that. Um, uh, it, it benefits us all. You know, I'm also I'm trying to go on a trade mission. This is to India. And I would love to know other members who would want me to represent their product or their service while I'm there. Um, so these are things I think at the global chamber, I, I hope we can all network within ourselves and then also network with uh, in the country. But so we receive briefings once a month um, on uh, the African. This was just access was called Access Africa. Now, and what do they do? They tell you, the best practices, you know, some of the factors, what, what from the U.S. government standpoint, what they feel the opportunities are. You know, they'll tell you the GDP, who weighed trade, how much exports the U.S. did last year, how much we imported from the country. And here, I think, is one of the key resources I think we don't take advantage of, or we do, but we could take advantage of it more. The financing is provided by the African Development Bank and the World Bank. One of the things I'm doing this year, 
I'm going to be, I'm doing a training session in Kenya. And it's on education, it's technology, Cisco, Microsoft, and we're looking for underwriters. And, and so we're approaching the Kenyan government and we're saying, hey, would you like to, you know, they, each of the countries have their, they've been funded through various, the ADB, the World Bank, Export Import, and the U.S., in, in terms of the African Development Bank and the World Bank, we joined in 1983. And let's say the way it works, they they will give a loan to that country for, say, education. Well, now when I go to Kenya, I'll say these are the services I would like to offer. You've already been funded for this. So you look at, I use the word RFP and tenders. It's, it's, that's not the correct word but you guys know what I mean. So now when I approach that country's government, and I'll say, oh, you have this initiative. I see you've been funded for this. We offer services in that area. And, and so that's a way to help you, at least it helps me focus on the service that I want to offer. And I know there's funding for it. Now that's if you want to do business with the government, okay, or the banks, you can do, uh, they, they provide opportunities. You can actually do uh, work with the World Bank and ADB, but you, knowing that certain initiatives have already been funded to the government, and here's the beauty of it, the U.S. Embassy, it advocates for you, right? Because let's be honest, the U.S. government has one of the big loan loan originators at the bank, they want U.S. companies to get a piece of that. So you have somebody advocating for you. Now, one of the things I'm pointing out here, and you might say, well, this is geared for large companies, for corporations, U.S. corporations. But what I feel we can do as smaller businesses is partner with the bigger companies, right? And, and we can get our piece of that too. So my my feeling is I heard the discussions about getting capital and this and that. Uh, that's where the capital may come from, the larger corporations. But you're you're their partner in, say Kenya or wherever. And so think about it that way. That's another way when you're doing your market research. So the embassy. The consulate, they advocate for you. And I and I think that's a, a great resource. Uh, just an example here. Um, when you go, when you get these uh, uh, marketplace intelligence, they tell you about the government priorities. So that's that's what I was referring to. They might say, and I'm going to show you guys an example in South Africa and, and, and in Ethiopia, where they've already they have their initiatives. So you want to tap into that. Now, for me, I'm tech, so I'm looking for ICT. But you know, you guys may be energy. I've heard energy discussions, agriculture, you know, healthcare. These are the big initiatives that that have already been funded, and that makes it easier for you. So you could just tap in to that. So again, here's an example. They said, okay, Ethiopia. Their top exports for the country, it was coffee, 1.2 billion. Their top, the top they export to, Somalia is their number one trading partner, but the US is number two. And we buy over 25% of their export, their coffee. Okay. So it helps you to kind of, at least it gives me a starting point of where to go. Now, I'm just giving you guys a little sample of this because of my time constraint. And, and but these are entire reports that'll get you started. Um, going on to South Africa, uh, you can see here with South Africa, population, GDP per capita, you know, the economic centers, like what I like about South Africa, you go to Johannesburg, you know, that's the, the gateway to other East African countries, Botswana, Tanzania, so I had an opportunity to, that, that might be your hub, 
again, it gives you some strategy and, and the government will help you out with that. And then, then they tell you what they feel are the positives and the challenges. So for example here, and, and uh, let me make this a little bigger. Um, so they might say, okay, here's the positive factors here. Strong financial, the most advanced economy in Sub-Sahara. It's a launching point for other African uh, countries. They have an affinity for U.S. lifestyle, good rule of law. What are some of the challenges? Well, power distribution we've heard about. South Africa doesn't have the high growth rate that the other African countries have, but they're more stable. There is high unemployment and there is crime. So you, you have to look at what are the opportunities and what are the challenges, okay? And, and remember, this is what our government is giving us. You have to go there and get on the ground and figure it out yourself too. So, but at least this helps you. Now, what I thought was interesting in South Africa, so they have the BBBEE, Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment, kind of like our diversity initiatives here, okay? And they have CST, Corporate Social Responsibility. So again, when I'm there, I'm certainly going to be a proponent of that initiative. Again, you have bigger U.S. companies might not be on board. As, as you guys know, there's a lot of pushback now with the diversity, equity, inclusion here. But you could be their representative abroad. That, just a thought. But at least we know from the research what's important. Okay, what that, what that country's initiative. Again, every country has their own initiative and their own funding for their initiatives. So you have to be aware of that. Um, then again, my, my space is technologies, ICT. South Africa has one of the most developed ICT. I mean, it's like here in the States. Um, they have a program called South Africa Connect. Their telecom is fastest growing in the sector. So these are things that I'm picking up on and helping me to target what service I'm going to offer. And again, of course, healthcare, you know, the majority of their tech is imported and drugs are imported. They have an affinity. U.S. health technologies are well regarded. So you, you have some natural advantages, say, in South Africa. Um, finally, uh, just some of the resources that has helped me that I found valuable uh, and, and they'll be happy um, uh, if you guys want to hit me up on LinkedIn or whatever, uh, feel free. But I'm in, uh, I, the International Trade Association of Greater Chicago, uh, they send out a great calendar every month of what's going on in the city. Some of it's free, some of it's not, but it lets you know what's going on here in Illinois in terms of trade. So I like them. I'm a member of the Corporate Council of Africa. They're out of D.C., had a great summit, annual summit each year. For example, I heard you guys talk about uh, Agora. You know, they're lobbying right now in D.C. to get that renewed because I think it's up for, for, so those are things that I think we could call our congressman or our senator and say, hey, we, this is important. We want this to be renewed. Um, so the corporate ad council, they're, they're more for larger corporations, but I think we're all fighting for the same agenda. We have the same agenda because I've heard it mentioned earlier. Uh, the Global Chamber of Commerce, of course, I would love for us, there, just us today talking, putting together a database of our product services, putting together export plans. These are things, you know, from a tech standpoint, I'm always help, uh, happy to help. And, and, and say, you know, put together the database, put together a website or whatever we need, anything that'll help us to do more trade internationally. Um, SBA has a program called Prosper Africa, really good. Again, these are all free resources. You can hear people. And then this is funny, I um, International Trade of the Greater Chicago, they sent out in their email once uh, the Trade Council of Kansas City they gave an export 101 program. It was great. 
And uh, it was free. And they help you develop export plans and this and that. Now, I don't live in Kansas City, but you can participate. So there are a lot of resources here. And I just want to leave you guys with that. I hope we can all keep networking. Kudos to Demetrius for, for putting this together. Uh, I, I'm really excited. I'm still excited about what we can do with Africa, with our training partners there. I'm going to hit up some of you uh, as soon as this is over. I want to keep the networking and dialogue going. So thank you. And Demetrius, I hand it back over to you. Any thank you. Thank you yeah, go so right much. in. Yeah, right thank in. you so much. So, so much practical information. Really, really appreciative. And I, I did really hone in on that, us creating a database or a website. That's a, an amazing idea. Thank you so much for that. So, yeah, do we have any other questions? We are right at, we're just at one o'clock. So, one have questions, yeah. we will take questions. Yeah, yeah I, put, I put a question in the in, in the chat box uh, um specifically for Chad. Uh, uh Chuck, Chuck, I would like you to speak briefly about the opportunities in the area of African talent supporting some business needs uh, from the yeah. US. Okay. Um one second here. I had to leave my my conference room here <laughs> a little bit, went a little bit over. But um, so we were talking about um, the African, I'm sorry, and I didn't see that question in the chat. No, no um, problem. No problem. I, I can repeat it. I say the opportunities for African talent, like tech savvy talent to support some business needs here in the U.S., like the Indians have done a BPO. Yeah. yeah. So what great question. And what I would like, um, like being a partner with Microsoft, we have, um, the, the, we we would love to get resources in Africa because Microsoft has opened up um, cloud facilities in South Africa. I think we have one in uh, uh, um, Kenya and Nigeria, but it's an opportunity for the programmers, particularly programmers, or developers, whoever, the younger people to um, participate with that. And, and that's a real easy way uh, to start. Um, and Because and the, the Microsoft resources, their, their facilities are over in Africa. They have like five or six. And you would have direct access to their cloud facilities, which we can easily get here in the States. So uh, that that's that's one quick and easy way I think we could tap into that young talent there. Um, also, it's just you know networking. There are a couple of technological organizations they want to reach out. Uh, I'm an internet service provider, so we got to do better uh, about networking across. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, that. So that that's a whole nother. There's a couple organizations. I'm going to definitely shoot you an email okay. so that uh, we'll we'll go from there. Definitely. Good Thank question. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I love the networking already going on. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? We have heard some fantastic information from uh, what sectors to get involved in. I, I need some of that rice, Comey, and I'm going to, I also need some of those peppers. I'm like, wow, I didn't know. Uh, Billions of dollars. Okay, who knew? And then uh, Miss Lewis, Miss Lewis Johnson, like learning about all of the mistakes is invaluable. Like if 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 you if one person is shipping something from Africa and learns about or hears this and can change the trajectory of what they're doing, like they're going to be so so much uh, better off. So thank you for that. And Chuck. Um, this was a great presentation from you. So practical. And I really appreciated hearing it. You said that you will be sending it out. Everyone said that though, if, if you'd like to have the presentations, then uh, we're fine to share. So you can um, send that to me or we can okay. you know, do it through LinkedIn and let's keep connecting. And I look forward to seeing you all on our next Africa presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Great job. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you great job. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.